And now let's talk about arranging spatial positions for networks, which includes trees. So there's three major ways to think about laying out networks. Um, one is as node link diagrams, one which works for both networks and trees. Another is an adjacency matrix. Um, and finally, enclosure, uh, where we're using containment marks, which is exclusively for trees. So let's go through and talk about those. So a very common uh, node link approach is an idiom specifically called force directed placement, which is a whole family um, of algorithms. Uh, they're all in the node link family, which means that what they do is use point marks for nodes and connection marks uh, to connect uh, the nodes together through explicit links being drawn. Now, what they are is an approach of using a uh, extended metaphor of energy minimization, where the analogy is nodes have repelling forces, links draw together like springs, and then you can treat this algorithmically as an optimization problem and think about things to minimize and maximize, for example, the number of edge crossings or edge node overlaps or a number of other uh, of these uh, readability metrics that you can think about. Now, What's very interesting about this approach is that although we've just spent a lot of time talking about the meaning of spatial position with tabular data, in fact, no meaning is directly encoded with spatial position with this approach. Sometimes proximity means something. Sometimes these forces have actually acted to say, you know, these nodes maybe uh, are very tightly linked together or in some sort of cluster or clique, as we can see in that uh, diagram with the purple ones on the top. However, sometimes proximity is pretty arbitrary. It just has to do with where things happen to end up, a different layout, maybe with a different random seed could have ended up in a different place. So it's a very interesting state of affairs that spatial position is being used in service of another goal, like minimizing these readability metrics, rather than directly encoding information in and of itself. So it's a very different regime. Um, so the kind of tasks people do with these node link diagrams is explore topological structure to try to do path following through that. Um, and also to look for things like clusters where there's a lot of nodes that are uh, very tightly coupled together. And we can clearly see some in this small network layout uh, using force directed placement MT3 on the right. A word about scalability. Um, in general graph theory, uh, we know that a graph of N uh, nodes could have up to um, n squared edges, uh, and that's what's considered dense. Now, really dense graphs, or even somewhat dense graphs, are not going to do well with these kinds of node link approaches. So, typically, uh, a good rule of thumb is if you've got any more than four times the number of uh, links that you have as nodes, you're probably not going to be very well served by force directed placement. Now it's also worth thinking algorithmically, because uh, graph drawing is another place where there's been quite a lot of algorithmic work. Um, and I'm, I'll mention it's called graph drawing, even though I'm using the term network in this tutorial. Uh, and so this is again, this uh, synonym where graphs and networks are being uh, used in, in different areas. Um, we can take the same idiom and simply change things at the algorithm level. So let's look at an example of this. Uh, Traditional force directed placement, uh, the simple one, it can do quite reasonably well with small graphs, but as soon as they get you know, beyond a few hundred nodes, even uh, less than that sometimes, they often get very brittle and fragile and stuck in local minima and really unable to achieve good results. So there's been a lot of work in trying to scale that up. So SFDP is a particular algorithm for multi-level force directed placement, where they take the nodes of the original network and construct a cluster hierarchy, a tree on top of that, where nodes that are uh, somehow um, near to each other topologically in the original graph are grouped together into meta nodes. Uh, and you can group those then in turn into meta nodes, and you can have an entire hierarchical structure of multiple levels on top of the original base nodes. And this is constructed exactly to speed up the computation of the placement of these nodes and their edges. So it, the encoding is the same, but the underlying algorithm is different, um, more powerful. And that cluster hierarchy is not explicitly shown. In contrast, we'll see some other things in upcoming snippets where uh, those cluster hierarchies are explicitly drawn, but not in this case. It's used to accelerate the computation. 
So the good news is, you know, this can get well beyond a, a couple of hundred nodes. In fact, it can computationally do well, you know, with, from a thousand nodes, 10,000 nodes. Now there's still this question of whether you can actually understand the results. The unfortunate situation is often it falls into these situations where we get, there's a technical term, the hairball problem uh, that's actually used in the graph drawing community where you just get incomprehensible, uh, extreme clutter, everything's drawn on top of each other and you really cannot see any structure at all. Um, so we really differentiate between computationally, can the algorithm execute in a reasonable amount of time from the visual encoding question of, is this resulting image actually comprehensible by people for a useful purpose? So those can have different answers. Let's think about an example of another major approach to drawing graphs, which is basically to turn them into a table. So we can take this network data and basically encode it in a very similar way to what we've already seen with heat map views. So what we do is we derive data. We take the network and derive a table. We treat the list of nodes as categorical attributes. Um, and then we come up with a quantitative attribute, which is that if there is a edge between two nodes, then we actually enter that as the cell in the table. Uh, that could be in fact, you know, a weighted edge uh, or simply an unweighted edge. So we have an example on the um, upper right where we have a node link view of a tiny, tiny graph. And then we have the adjacency matrix view of that very small graph. So that you can see that when there is a, a link in the node link view, we see that that cell in the adjacency matrix is filled in. For a undirected graph, we only need to draw half uh, of the, the matrix triangle. Um, you would only have different things in cases of directed graphs where you have uh, directionality in the edge. The key thing about this is it's far more scalable, uh, particularly as the number of edges grow than the node link layouts. There's a slightly larger one um, down below where we've got, again, a node link on the right and a adjacency matrix on the left. One key thing about the adjacency matrix, just like with heat maps, is you typically want to run reordering uh, algorithms to actually do this, um, essentially find the clusters automatically so that they can be visually obvious rather than just, just looking like noise. Um, this question is sometimes called uh, bi-clustering or seriation. There's been a lot of algorithmic work in that area. Um, here's the key thing. Again, just like heat maps, we could have a thousand by a thousand nodes um, and that would mean we could handle up to one million edges without the kind of hairball overplotting that we saw with the node link views. Now, the question is, okay, if these are so great, why don't we use them all the time? Well, there's good and bad things about adjacency matrix views. Their size is completely predictable, the amount of pixels you need. Uh, they're highly scalable. This sort of reordering uh, to try to find clusters is something that uh, can be done on them. It is possible to train people to do some topology understanding tasks on these. Here's a picture showing how you can find these cliques or clusters. Um, however, they're just not nearly as good as no link diagrams for things involving understanding topological structure and path tracing. It's much, much harder. Um, and most people find no link diagrams far more intuitive without any training at all. So there's been some empirical studies about what's the cutoff point between when you would use node link and when you would use adjacency matrix views. And certainly if the network is small, node link is very straightforward. If the network is enormous, node link is hopeless and you might want to use a matrix. But if your task involves topological structure, then a matrix view isn't gonna support that very well at all. So this is part of why graph drawing is a very, very active area of people trying to find algorithmic improvements that will lead to idioms that are actually understandable and scaling up. So now let's switch from graphs to trees for a moment. Well, the same idea of a node link view for a network is something we can also do for a tree. Uh, so here's an example where we're drawing a tree. They have both rectilinear and radial layouts. Here I'm showing you the radial layout. Um, so again, nodes are points, links are connections. In this case, they're being drawn as curves, not just as straight lines. And in this case, it's a radial view, so the root is at the center. And as you move out from the, that center point, you get the depth in the tree is something that you can read off directly from spatial position. And siblings are, are, prox are close by um, and are laid out in, in angles close to that. 
So again, this is good for tasks like topological understanding and path following. Um, if you do need to actually read the labels, which is typically what makes these drawings useful, then maybe you'd be able to fit around a thousand nodes on a thousand by thousand pixels display. If you can get by without needing node labels and you're just trying to show topological structure, maybe you could get up to around 10,000 nodes. Um, and of course, the key thing about trees is that the number of nodes and the number of edges is uh, basically the same. And so you don't have to have this problem of wondering about the density as you do with networks. Now there's another approach to drawing trees, which is instead of using connection to use containment. This is very suitable when you have attributes at the leaf nodes of the tree. So the tree map approach um, is one where you're using containment. And so you're using these area marks that are containing uh, their children beneath them. Um, it's a rectilinear approach. Um, and the size of the leaf node encodes the quantitative attribute. And then that's inherited. And then the parents of that also and here at that size and so on, all the way up to there's an enclosing box, which is the uh, root node, which is the entire tree. This is very, very good if you have tasks that involve understanding an attribute at the leaf nodes. It's not nearly as good for understanding topological structure, but in fact, it's very good for understanding uh, leaf attributes at the nodes. So this is part of that trade-off. And much like uh, the adjacency matrix views in the limit, you can get up to about a million leaf nodes if you're aggressive and have essentially one pixel per uh, leaf node. And there's been some work on that. So thinking about these two approaches of connection and containment, let's just try to summarize a bit of what we've talked about. Um, in network drawing, we're often dealing with uh, link marks rather than node marks. Um, in the connection case where you're drawing a line between nodes, uh, that's all node link diagram styles. The emphasis there really is topological structure and path tracing works for both networks and trees. In contrast, containment, where you're actually having a 2D area that's enclosing some number of nodes, um, and all the variants of tree maps are like this, is really emphasizing attribute values at the leaves through a size coding, and it's only uh, workable for trees because they're the only ones that have this uh, hierarchical guarantees, uh, which of course you don't have with general graphs. So here we have a few examples of smaller and larger um, graphs using these two things. Um, and as usual, the answer is there's no single right answer. It depends on what your task is. So again, we've got some further reading and uh, now is the time for thinking about questions, and this is also wrapping up.